Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, this week's talk on the Jews of Poland. The talk is dedicated in memory of Mayor Ben Herschel. And uh, it's interesting when you speak about the Jews of Poland uh, to, to understand who we're talking about. Because usually when you speak about a Jewish community, you pretty much know more or less where the borders are. But when we speak of the Jews of Poland, because the borders of Poland kept changing so often in such drastic ways, when we speak about Polish Jews, we're actually speaking about Jews who lived in what's today not only Poland, but Belarus. Uh, you have the Jews, uh, people don't know that, Ukraine, Lithuania, Latvia, Moldavia. Moldavia. All these places used to be under the government of Poland at certain periods of time. And then there was a time where there was no Poland, uh, whether it's when it was uh, under the Austro-Hungarian, divided between Austro-Hungarians. So to be a Polish Yid does not mean necessarily you would live today within the borders of uh, modern day Poland, just because everything changed so much and and you uh, you had people in such different places. So again, so just to be clear, when we say Polish Jews, it could mean Jews who were living in Lithuania, Belarus, um, Ukraine, etc. Now, uh, that being said, it, it, when you speak of this, it's, we're talking about millions and millions of Jews, the largest Jewish community ever. And it's it, we, we try and focus on the way Jewish life looked at the time, but it's really hard to speak about this topic and not to cry, because uh, it's important to recognize that in the Holocaust, this is a community that was wiped out in a way that no other community has been. Uh, there were other communities, for example, what was called Lithuanian Jewry, 94% uh, got killed in the Holocaust. But uh, when you speak about Poland, you're talking about millions. Uh, just from Poland today, 3 million Jews. So about probably more than 4 million Jews killed in the Holocaust are what we would maybe call Polish Yidin or, or Jews from Poland. And it's hard to speak about the communities, the cities, the contributions, the books they wrote, the communities, the, the, the chasiduyot that they had without really feeling the pain of the many, many, many millions of Jews who were wiped out during the years of the war in the most cruel way uh, when you speak about it. It's also in, in, important to note that the Jews of Poland, in a way, suffered from the Holocaust first because uh, Germany went into Poland in 1939. Yes, there were Jews in Germany who suffered from the uh, German Nazis, but, but for Polish Jews, it, it was right away. The, the Germans came in and right away you had get ghettos, deportations, etc. And so those Jews were starved and emaciated all the way from 1939. Whoever survived had to survive all the way till 1945. The amount of suffering uh, that Polish Jews have been through, you know, even those who were uh, killed in concentration camps was often years, and it's just hard to ignore that. What is the biggest contribution of Polish Jewry uh, to the Jewish world as we know it today? Uh, so it's interesting, you know, you have with Spanish Jews, they, you have their contribution. It's interesting that uh, there's a, a, a Polish Jewish author named Avram Levinson, and he writes that the greatest contribution of Polish Jews is not the famous rabbi, it's not a famous author or book or political leader. The biggest contribution of Polish Jews was the masses, the number of Jews who just had a warm, as you call it, a, a Yiddish heart, a Jewish heart. He writes, behind, behind every kapota was a burning heart with love for every Jew, with love for Judaism. And Polish Jewry really had that. They were the most organized Jewish community in history. There were free loan societies for those who needed financial help. There was education for every Jewish child. There were soup kitchens. There were was mutual aid. Uh, when there were anti-Semites uh, beating up on Jews, you had Jews gather together and beat up the thugs that uh, were beating up Jews. And in that sense, Polish Jewry is unique uh, because we're not looking at this rabbi or the other, we're not looking at this contribution or the other, we're looking at a warm Jewish community that is organized, that cares for everyone, whether it's Achnasat Orchim, Bikur Cholim, uh, all these structures existed in other Jewish communities, but nothing, uh, nothing was like Polish Jewry in terms of caring for every single aspect of Jewish life from birth to burial, Everything had a chevra, an organization, 
So, and that's really the beauty of Polish Jewry. It's the, the you know, it's the Chatzkele, it's the Yankele, it's the Chanele, it's the, the every Jew that really is just so passionate uh, about uh, Judaism. You know, some of you may have heard those stories they have about Moshe the water carrier and Chatzkele Lekovet Shabbos. Every Jew was w- w- as simple as they were. Uh, was was a, a, a fire, was a powerhouse, and someone who really was very, very passionate uh, about Judaism. And that's, in fact, what happened when they mobilized in the 20th century with organizations like Hachalutz and uh, people like Jabotinsky, Menachem Begin, David Ben-Gurion, all these people of, of Polish Jewish heritage uh, symbolized that, that fire of every simple Jew, uh, that unity, that ability to care for others, that was who Polish Jews were. It was it was the every Jew, it was the community, it was the Kehillah. Uh, and with that in mind, let's look a bit at the history of Jews in Poland. Uh, Jews in Poland uh, lived there already 1,100 years ago. There were some Jews who were coming there for commerce, but the biggest influx of Jews into Poland actually, and this will help you understand a lot about Yiddish, the Jews of Poland actually came in the, the, the bigger numbers when the Crusades began in Western Europe. So essentially the, 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 the foundation of Polish Jewish community comes from Jews who are fleeing the Crusades uh, in the 10, 1100s. It's from Jews who are fleeing the uh, Black the black Plague uh, pogroms, etc. And these are Jews who are coming into Poland. Now, the unique aspect it, which we forget about because of modern history, the unique aspect about Polish Jews is that they are invited in. And uh, the landlords who are trying to develop Poland, the dukes, the counts, the uh, owners of big portions of land, know that Jews are very good as administrators, and they invite them in. And not only do they invite them in, but they write them letters uh, securing their rights as a minority in the law. So Jews are invited in administrative positions, and they come to Poland on the request of these dukes, kings, and they are asked to um, they are asked to manage the uh, the country, you know, locally. Now, interestingly, uh, there's a lot of urban legends that really express how Jew- Polish Jews felt about Poland. So, for example, the, how, does anyone know how to say Poland in Hebrew or in Yiddish? Po- po- Polish or Polin, Poilin, yeah. So uh, the the Polish Jews used to say that it's actually a short for Polin, which means in Hebrew, this is where you should rest. Jews saw Poland as a place uh, for them to rest, as a place for them to relax, and so indeed, life for Jews in Poland was much much better than it was in Ashkenaz, in Germany and France. In many ways, life in Poland was much better uh, than their brethren in the West. Definitely also later, when, when you see what happened in Spain, they, they were better off than many, many uh, Jewish communities. And they were invited and given privileges and, and great jobs. They were given managerial jobs, uh, you know, manage my property, manage my area. And that's how they come in. Uh, the king of Krakow in the 1100s puts in a, a very heavy fine for anyone who's violent towards Jews. And the aristocracy of Poland really defended the Jews. And, and the Jews reciprocated by being uh, very loyal to them as well. Uh, and so another interesting thing that happens professionally, which will help you understand a lot of history, is that Jews go through a professional transformation. If you're a Jew living in Western, Western Europe, what, what kind of jobs do you have? Usually you can be a silversmith, a money lender, they ask you to be the, the church or whoever it was, uh, you have very limited uh, employment. But the second you come to Poland, you can manage the lands. You can be someone who runs a tavern. You can be someone who manages the roads, the mills, the wine production, the, the, uh, the schnapps. Suddenly Jews have all these jobs that they are managerial, but they're not just banking and, and things that Western Europe limited them to. Uh, so Jews actually really enjoy this and they become property managers, hotel managers, uh, and, and go into fields uh, other than the very limited ones that Western Europe allowed them, allowed them for to do. Uh, and, that's, uh, and, and that changes life because suddenly, you know, Jews are no longer only uh, in those very limited professions. 
interestingly, when you have influxes of anti-Semitism in Poland, it's most often when Gentiles from Germany move to Poland. So when German Gentiles immigrate to Poland, they import with them anti-Semitism, which did not uh, was not as rampant in Poland itself. So it's just an uh, interesting thing that uh, you know hate came to Poland actually from uh, from the the West. Now uh, another interesting thing besides for being called uh, Poland, which meant uh, uh, you know you should you should rest here. There's an urban legend among the Jews there about Esther to the Malach. And I don't know if it's true or not, but there's this uh, rumor uh, or, or a legend about the King Casimir, who's a great Polish king, having a Jewish mistress named Esterke. And she, like Esther in the book of Esther, Queen Esther, she advocates for more rights for the Jews. Now, of course, uh, the anti-Semites, there's a guy named the Bishop, uh, Bishop Jan de Logos, who was a Polish uh, priest and historian, he, of course, writes that uh, it was a seductive move. So the reason that the Jews are so uh, subversive and have so much influential power is because they were able to sneak their way in by this mistress named Esther. So you can have the same legend, urban legend, but different sides of it. To the Jews, this Esther was a figure of, of you know, how good things were for them. And to the anti-Semites, it was uh, how they beat the system. Yeah. Uh, all right, so that's uh, the, the, the Jews even had a, a tradition that uh, Noah's uh, dove put his uh, leaf there, the, the, the olive branch. So life was good in Poland. If you're Jewish, life was good. Now, it's interesting. The shtetl, we think of the shtetl as some natural creation. It's not. When we think about the shtetl, we think, oh, must have been a bunch of Jews living in a town together, and one played the fiddle, and one, uh, you know, was a milkman, and one was a water carrier. The shtetl was anything but natural. The shtetl was not natural. The shtetl was the Polish landlords took their Jewish administrators, and they said, okay, you guys can all live here. And it's an extraordinary creation. Why? Because suddenly, for the first time in our history, Jews are not a minority. We are a, uh, minor a, a majority minority town. So suddenly, unlike uh, other cities in Europe where there's a, a Judenstrasse, a, a street of Jews, in Poland, it's not a Judenstrasse. It's not just a street of Jews, but it's an entire town of Jews. It's where the Polish Duke can put all his administrators, accountants, uh, people who are managing taverns, that is the shtetl. So the shtetl is very much a artificial creation, and it gives Jews this amazing capacity that they've never had, uh, not never, but haven't had for a while, where they um, are a ma majority, yeah? What? Do you mean uh, in the in 1900s? We'll get to there. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. But this is uh, this is uh, early on, uh, before way before uh, you know modern day uh, issues. But basically, the Jews are able to live in these shtetlach, and th th there's this amazing thing where the Jews can live as a minority, but that's a majority. So you have a town of Jews, sort of like uh, has anyone ever heard of uh, like New Square, Curious Yoel? It's places where you have. Uh, Jews who are a minority, but they are the majority of their town. And that's not something Jews had outside of Poland. Uh, it's a very, very special experience. Now, since the Jews were very welcome there and uh, they, uh, the, peop the kings and rulers wanted them to stay, uh, they worked with them. And one of the things that Jews had to do is they had to pay a different tax bracket. If you're Jewish, you pay different taxes. How do you collect the taxes from the Jews? So for that, the ruler established something called the Va'ad Arba Aratzot. And it's a Jewish self-governing body that controls, it literally means the council of four countries. And it's, a, it's, it's primary purpose is to raise taxes. How? Well, if a king comes to a room full of people and says, I don't care how, but you all have to pay $100 taxes, how do you decide who's going to give more? You can't collect the same taxes from uh, Moishala, the water carrier, as you do from Yankala, the Gvir, the rich man. So what do you do? And uh, also you have different towns, right? You can't collect the same taxes you do in uh, Manhattan as you do in, uh, you know, a little tiny shtetl. It's not the same, uh, not the same amount. So how do you decide who's going to pay how many taxes? 
So for this, the king establishes a va'ad arba aratzot, a council of four different countries, four different regions. This is in the 1500s, 1520. And they represent different areas. The four areas are, are one's called Poznan, or, Poz, or Pozna, which is Krakow and uh, Lublin. One is called Rysin, which is Galicia, Lvov. And uh, you have uh, Wol Wolin, which is Ludmir, Kremnitz. And you have Lithuania, Brisk, and Grodna, uh, and then Vilna. Now, at different points, there were some secessions, and not everyone was always in the Vad Arba Rotsot, but that is the Vad. Now, why is this Vada an extraordinary thing? Because it is Jewish self-governance. Uh, it's the only place where Jews can govern themselves in such a huge way. Think about it. It's Jews over many, many, many hundreds of miles, a huge area, which is today Poland, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and they are controlling themselves. They make their own decisions, they collect their own taxes, and it's a huge amount of power. So all Jewish life is managed internally by the Vad Arba Aratzot, and they, uh, they, they were able to govern together. What do you think some of the famous laws that they made were? So, some people speak about them in the context of Kitniot, but uh, they made a few rules that basically uh, made sure that everyone uh, governed in a very, very, uh, that, that everyone was under the, the, the rule of the, um, of the uh, council. And they made rules such as you're not allowed to print any book without their, uh, without a letter, haskama, without a rabbinic approval. That's why if you see sometimes, you know how today you take a book and it says on the back what certain authors have said about it and, uh, you know, you see in the back, uh, bestseller by the New York Times or whatever. That is uh, the equivalent of a haskama. So in those days, if you wanted to publish a book on Chumash or whatever it is, you needed a letter from, an, a, re from a recognized rabbi saying that your book is okay. Uh, what else did they control? Who becomes a rabbi? They made very, very, they had a very powerful grip of who would become a rabbi and who wouldn't. And they controlled, uh, you know, what would happen internally. Another very important thing that they did to the, that has ramifications on banking to this day is something called heter iska, which means if you're Jewish, you're not allowed to lend to another Jew money or even food with interest. You're not allowed to say, take $100, pay me back $110. But sometimes you need to do a loan that's for the purpose of investment. It's not just a loan. You invest it in someone else's company. So how do you decide what's a loan and what's a investment? So they put together a document that allows for lending with interest in a way that's appropriate uh, according to Jewish law. Interestingly, they also uh, tried to have on this council people who were lay leaders. We're not Torah scholars. And the king dropped that idea. Why? Because since there were uh, no Torah scholars there, people didn't listen. It's only when the people who sat on this council were great Torah scholars that people listened to them. So it tells you about Polish Jewry, how much they respected uh, the study of Torah. Another the law that they made, you would not believe it. A rabbi is not allowed to bribe or buy or loan his way into a position, which tells you that people were doing this. Meaning, if you wanted to become the rabbi of Krakow, uh, and you somehow paid off anyone or, or you know, lent a lot of money, you cannot have that position. Another thing that they did is if you want any position in the community leadership, you cannot do so by uh, influencing the government. You cannot lobby the Polish ruler and say, make me in charge of the Jewish community. So the Vadar Varotot had an iron fist on the Jewish community, no outside intervention, don't use the government to get jobs in the Jewish community, don't publish a book without our permission, basically a very strong hold on the Jewish community. Now, um, what happens if you break the rules? What do you think happens if you break the rules? And this is, by the way, just in general, a very good point in terms of understanding Polish Jewry. And, and what happens if you break the rule? Your taxes go up? So it's interesting. Uh, he, the reason that they the reason they had such strong control is because if you didn't listen, uh, there were consequences. I'll read it to you what they say uh, for those who break the rules. So they made a rule, for example, 
uh, the Polish government would lease out the person who would make the whiskey or vodka or whatever it is, yeah? So there's a job that's given and uh, you're the guy in charge of, you have the, uh, the exclusive rights to produce whiskey, just for as an example. So what happens if you want to bypass another Jew and take his job away? What if, you know, if the government said you're in charge of making bourbon and I come to the government and I say, I'll pay you off so I can be in charge of making bourbon. That's a violation of the internal Jewish government. What happens to me if I break that law? Listen to that. You are excommunicated, not only in this world, but also in the world to come after you die. And you are basically a non-Jew. If you make bread, it's like a kuti making, it's not kosher. Your wine is like the wine of an idol worshiper, and it is forbidden for consumption. If you shecht an animal, it is treif. And uh, you are buried outside of the Jewish cemetery, and no one is allowed to uh, get married with you or your offspring, or even help them find a match. Uh, and and basically, a lot of curses. So you can see why they had a grip on the community. So it has its blessings, but I'm sure there are people who found themselves on the outs. Uh, so this is the power of excommunication. We're going to see later that it actually had some very negative impacts. So uh, there's a fellow later, Jacob Frank, who was a horrible person, and he was a, a leader of the Shabtites V followers. We'll see what that was. And uh, 4,000 Jews followed him, and they were excommunicated. And if you're excommunicated, that means the government does not recognize you. You have no rights to live in the Jewish shtetl. You have no rights to live in the Christian shtetl. And you basically need to decide, are you going to live in the forest or are you going to convert to Christianity, in which case they chose to convert to Christianity. So if you're on the outs with the Jewish community, there's no middle ground. If you decide to be like the, you know, the out, outsider, uh, you're not going to, you're not going to live on the periphery of the community. You will be uh, outside, either in the wilderness or living as a Catholic. Uh, so that that is how how powerful uh, that that was. Now, one of the greatest uh, rabbis and rabbinic figures in the history of Polish Jewry actually lived a very short life. His name is Rabbi Moshe Iserlish. Uh, he lived in the 1500s. Yeah, the Rama. Ah, Rama is short for Rabbi Moshe Iserlish. Well, in, in Hebrew, at least. In English, it would be an I, Iserlish. But uh, Rabbi Moshe Iserlish is a very, very uh, amazing and, and prominent figure, not only in the history of Polish Jewry, but also in the history of uh, the Jewish people. Why? He decides he's going to do something that has never been done before. He will codify Jewish law. He's going to write a book exactly what Jews need to do. He will extract from the Talmud only the points that are uh, necessary. However, he learns that as he's doing it, imagine doing such a thing, someone else already wrote the book. So as he's working on this, he discovers that in, 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 in Israel, uh, there's a rabbi, a Sephardic rabbi named Rabbi, uh, uh, rabbi Yosef Karo, and that, that book is already being published. So he does, I mean, there's all kinds of now more urban legends about this, but he decides uh, in a very altruistic way, he will not publish a competing work. What he will do is he is going to publish the same book that Rabbi Caro published with amendments, meaning he's going to say, this is what is Sephardic custom. However, the custom of Polish Jews or our custom, he doesn't say Poland necessarily, is uh, different. So he takes and that's the way it's printed to this day. If you open any code of Jewish law, there's the main letters, the big letters, and then there's this addendums. This is the way this is done in Sephardic communities, but in our community, uh, it's done a bit differently. And he does this, and to this day, he is the codifier of Ashkenazi law. Who do you think was upset at him for doing this? Who might be upset? Was it the Sephardic Jews who were upset that he was uh, putting an addendum? No, it was the Jews of Ashkenaz, Germany. And they say, what do you mean? Poland is a branch of our Jewish community. The Ashkenaz community of Frankfurt, of, uh, uh, of Worms, of, of Magenta, all these places, we are the older, we are the oldest Jews of Ashkenaz. So how can you write 
uh, how can you write that this is our custom, referring to all Ashkenazi Jews or non-Sephardic Jews, without consulting us, the um, you know the, the the ultimate source of Ashkenazi minag? Uh, and so they were unhappy with him. Uh, and he says, and when they write about him, they're so upset that they say, uh, listen carefully. Uh, this is a, a, a kind of an extreme line. Brace yourself. And I know if you're from Baghdad, you definitely will not like this. They write for, from Germany. They're writing really of Germany versus Poland. They write, they write, The Torah has been entrusted with the Jews of Ashkenaz since the destruction of the Second Temple. They are so furious at him for deciding what the halacha is based on this suburb like suburban area, which is an offshoot of Germany, uh, and not consulting them. So that's uh, that's uh, just an interesting thing. And he lived a very short life, according to some traditions, 33, according to others, about 40. But he lived a very short life, and yet his publications are just all over the place in terms of deciding what Jewish life should look like. In 1569, something extraordinary happened. Poland, and you should really see the map of how this looks, Poland goes from being a country like this big uh, to being this huge empire because they unify with the Lithuanians. And that makes Poland not just the Poland that we know today, but they expand into uh, what is today, today Ukraine, Lithuania, Latvia, mm -hmm. Moldova. It's this huge, vast empire. Now, the Jewish uh, people are in demand. Why? Because the uh, Polish landlords, dukes, and uh, you know important people want to uh, cultivate or colonize or take advantage or even enslave the farmers and the peasants in these new territories. And who do they trust? They trust the Jews. Who's literate? The Jews. Who knows how to do math? The Jews. And so they send the Jews into Ukraine and say, okay, now I'm in charge of this huge swath of land. You will be my tax collector. The Ukrainians, and we're going to see how this played out later, the Ukrainians never saw their Polish landlord. The Polish landlord was enjoying life in, uh, in, in Warsaw, while the Jewish tax collector was showing up in uh, uh, Lvov, let's say, and uh, collecting taxes. So this created a lot, a lot of hate towards the Jews because the Jews were the managers for all these new Polish landlords. And, uh, you know, we're going to see how later this uh, played out. But uh, it's just interesting to see how quickly uh, the, this uh, uh, Commonwealth grew. And with this growth came a lot of immigration from the West. More and more Jews saw Poland as their home. Uh, it's very, very interesting because uh, there's something called the, uh, they refer to it as the demographic miracle. And I, I can't elaborate too much on it, but basically you have a demographic miracle. How many Jews are living in Poland in the 1900s, in 1930? Anyone know? How much? Before the Holocaust, how many Jews are living in Poland? Almost uh, three and a half million. Uh, 250 years later, before that, it's 30,000. The Jews of Poland multiply in a way that's considered a miracle. There's medical papers about this because uh, they go from being 30,000 to 3 million within about 250 years. They speak about how the Jews multiplied in Egypt and we went from 70 to a few million. And people say, how's, how's that possible? Well, in Poland, it worked. And uh, one of the theories, the reason it worked is because when a couple would get married in Poland, where did they live? First of all, people got married at 12, 13. Where do you get married if, you, uh, if you're 12 or 13 and you're a, a, a good Jewish boy or girl? With the parents. With the parents. And so the, the, the uh, young moms were taken care of. They were not malnourished. You know, es mein kind, anyone ever hear es mein kind? Eat my child. It's a very Polish line, right? You, you make sure your child is wet, well fed. So the, uh, the, the moms were in great care of their, of their Yiddish mama. So the Yiddish mama was taking care of them and they were having a lot of children. And you had a very low, both uh, maternal mortality rate, not very, but relatively, uh, maternal mortality rate and uh, also a low rate of uh, 
of uh, the, the the children dying, uh, and so that was a that was a very big deal. However, uh, what you have then later is in 1648 something that would change Polish Jewry, uh, the Ukrainian farmers uprising, and this is an interesting topic, and it's so relevant today more than it was 10 years ago for sure. A fellow who is considered until the Holocaust the worst villain only to be, uh, you know, the title was taken away from him by Hitler, but uh, the worst villain in the history of the Jews and modern history of the Jews was this guy Bogdan Khmelnytsky. And basically he's a Ukrainian nationalist, even though he's a Polish a bit. Uh, and he decides he's gonna liberate Ukraine from Poland and he's gonna fight for the, uh, for the uh, peasants. And so when he's doing this, who do you kill first if you're trying to overthrow the Poles? Uh, the Jews, because the Jews are the, just first of all, there's always a dark corner in their hearts for the Jews. They always like to hate on the Jews. There's the religious aspect, but uh, also they want to, the, the Jews are the tax collectors and the property managers, and they're the debt collectors and the bankers. And he kills, some estimates go as far as 100,000 Jews in the pogroms of uh, 1648, also known as Tafchet and Taftet. And uh, that is something that will reshape Polish Jewry in many ways, not only in terms of the numbers that were lost, but also it will turn people uh, into despair. And uh, you have uh, movements of, of uh, Renaissance uh, and, and, and uh, like Hasidut, but also predatory movements like the false messiahs of Shabtai Tzvi and Jacob Frank. Uh, before I continue uh, to speak about different towns and different aspects of uh, Jewish life in Poland, I don't know if everyone knows this, but we have someone with us from Poland, born in Poland, and who lived the war, uh, lived, so if you don't mind coming up, uh, who lived the war. Uh, so you can talk here, so also the people on Zoom can hear. Are you able to? Yeah. Um, but basically, who, who lived the war in Poland uh, was, if I can give a bit of an introduction, yeah. uh, was hidden with a Polish family during the Holocaust with her mother. So if you can just stand here, yeah. you can also speak to us and also to yeah. the camera, just in, uh, speak about the town you were born in, yeah. and just to give us a I, quick I, look. What was like in a town that it's not big, not small. It was very nice, very nice, but a lot of Jews lived there. And they were very educated, you know, very really doctors and lawyers, and they survived the war because the, the Poles needed them, you know, they needed for different things, the doctors, you know, one of my friends, you know, her family saved a family before he was a doctor, uh, I, I don't know. Chirurg, I don't know, a surgeon, you know, and they he needed his wife had something very bad, and he needed this doctor, you know, to operate it on her. He said, Yeah, I'll do it for you and I'll save your wife, everything will be okay. But if you'll save my family, and he did, you know, he did survive, the whole family survived. Only, you know, a few of the doctors, mostly doctors, uh, the lawyers, you know, survived because they had the connection, they needed the Poles, needed them, you know, for different uh, reasons, you know. And can you tell us how, how Jewish life was in Poland after the war? After the war was, was very bad because the communist, you know, the Russians were there, you couldn't talk, you couldn't this, the school was limited, you know, and it was very bad. You know, it wasn't like before the war, my mother tells me, told me, you know, so it was different, you know, until, you know, and it was very anti-Semitic. They were so anti-Semitic in Poland till today. You know, they love the Jews. I have a friend, you know, he goes to Poland and sits there. And he, he, you know, is working on the cemeteries, you know, to, 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 to do, I don't know what he's doing there, but anyway, he loves the Poles and they cater to him. So he is, he is there in heaven. All right. Does anyone, yeah. you want to take questions a second? Does anyone have a question? Because if not, yeah. then we have uh, someone here. Yeah, uh, well, whatever. First hand account. Here. 
if anyone online has a question, mm -hmm. uh, we have, what's your first name? Sally. Sally, who's from Pshemishol. Yeah. Uh, ah, so here everyone can see you. One second. Ah, there you are. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyone anyway, have questions about Jewish life in Przemysl in Poland before the war? And you stayed there also long after the, yeah, right? Yeah, you I should stayed about uh, 10, 15 years after the Holocaust in Poland. Yeah, I came in 58, you know. Mm -hmm. He couldn't come before because my my I had the uncle here, as I told you, you know, but he, you know, the visa wasn't, you know, the Polish people, mm -hmm. the government didn't let us go mm -hmm. until, you know, later on. Wow. And, uh, yeah. So All right. I stayed forever. Thank you. Thank you. It's look, it's uh, not often that we get a first hand uh, first hand account. Our, yeah, so uh, just uh, just uh, quickly to, to go back to 1648, uh, you have the pogroms of Chmelnitsky, and this sends the Jews into a, a state of shock. Why? Because it wasn't only physical shock, but Poland was the place that was the safer place. Poland was the better place. You came to Poland because you fled Germany, you fled to France, the Crusades, etc., and so Chmelnitsky really shook everyone's uh, uh, consciousness. Now, this led to the popularity of a fellow named Shabtai Tzvi. Has anyone ever heard of him? Yes. Basically, he was coming from Turkey, but he said he is the Messiah. He is the Mashiach. And I see people rolling their eyes. I wish more people would. Why? Because thousands of people believed him. Why did people believe him? Because people were broken and uh, shocked. And so he kind of was able to, to get that crowd. And many thousands of people believed that, yes, this is Mashiach. And they sold their houses and they got their properties ready. Eventually, he converted to Islam and was killed. But uh, he was followed by a, a successor who was a Polish Jew named Jacob Frank, who was a terrible actor. And he did many, many, part of his, his cult following was uh, they, they believed in acts of immorality, etc. And uh, the people followed them. And uh, the way the community got a grip of things was by excommunicating them, which in some cases meant that they had to convert to Christianity. Why? If you were not a member of the Jewish community, you had to be a member of some community. And so they went and they told the Jews, look, this is betrayal. Why are you excommunicating us? We now have to join the Catholics and turn on you. Uh, but that was uh, the nature of excommunication and keeping uh, the, uh, the, you know, the community's sort of the, the, the leadership's grip on the community. Let's go a bit uh, uh, forward. As we continue, uh, the demographics start exploding. Jews become a huge amount of Poland, many, 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 many Polish Jews, millions of Jews living in Poland, and Poland is the largest Jewish community in the world. Uh, it's the largest Jewish community in the world, and uh, Polish Jews are affected also by modernization, what we call Haskala, where they start getting education and assimilating, uh, and there's a huge uh, move of urbanization. People are moving to the big cities, uh, and uh, that leads to some assimilation. Interestingly, a lot of Jews become Polish nationalists, but not so many. Jews choose Yiddish uh, to say that they are separate from Poland. And while Yiddish was used as a assimilationist tool in Russia, meaning it was a way of saying I'm Jewish and that's it, no religion, Yiddish was a way for Polish Jews to say we are Polish, but we're also Jewish. Uh, it was sort of an ethnic way to not assimilate. So speaking Yiddish meant you were not assimilating. And this is when Poland uh, has a lot more nationalism and pogroms. I don't think many people here heard about this, but in the early 1900s, there's an increasing number of pogroms in Poland. Uh, they, they kill more and more Jews, uh, are, are killed by Polish nationalists. And there's this debate by uh, people in Poland, do we let a nation that defines itself as not Polish to be part of Poland's democracy. And as Poland gains independence and as Jews are elected to the Polish parliament, there's also growing anti-Semitism saying, look, they are not like us, they are not part of us. And this anti-Semitism escalates until the Holocaust. Now uh, we come to the most difficult point uh, debated today, 
which is uh, what is the role of people in Poland in the Holocaust? I'll just give you a heads up before you say anything, before you tell me about this, what you think, think twice. <clears throat> There's a law they passed in Poland in 2018 that says that if you, uh, if you uh, say that the Polish people are partially responsible for the Holocaust, you uh, break the law. I don't know if they put anyone in jail for it, but they made this law four years ago. So if you go to Poland and you say the Polish people are partially responsible for the genocide of the Jews, which is true, just like it's true in Ukraine and Belarus, and uh, it's true basically almost every European country, uh, you are, uh, you're breaking the law. Uh, so what happens during the Holocaust? In 1939, September 1st, the Germans move in, Molotov-Ribbentrop, they split the country, uh, the Bug River, I think, is the line. And uh, many, many, many millions of Jews are now under the control of uh, Germany. At this time, uh, there are many Polish individuals that help the Jews. I'm going to briefly uh, say, give the history on, on the issue. Uh, many, many Polish individuals help Jews. 80% of the calories that come into the Warsaw Ghetto are brought in from outside. Uh, the Germans essentially made a starving machine where they would give 200 calories a day per person. And so that's not something that you can live off. And so most of the food is imported from outside. A lot of individual Poles do help Jews, but the Polish movement uh, as a national movement, whether it's, it's uh, uh, different armies that they have, the partisans are highly anti-Semitic. In fact, they have uh, recent studies where they show how the, um, the rural Poles helped kill the Jews in a way that wasn't even, uh, you know, it's one thing if someone refused a Jew knocking on their door. If, if a Jew knocks on your door at night and you know you can be killed by the Germans for hiding them, it's hard to judge you for not hiding them. But if you go and you chase in the forest Jews to kill them, that's a whole different story. And unfortunately, that was the reality for many in rural Poland. But at the same time, there are more Poles who are opposed to this than there are, say, German scholars. So uh, when Germany comes into Poland, they kill all the intelligentsia, a lot of which was pro-Jewish. And so uh, there are many Poles who are ideologically opposed to what's happening to the Jews, whether it's humanitarian reasons or other reasons. And unlike Germany, Lithuania, and other countries, there are also many Poles who are opposed to the genocide of the, the Jewish people. It's important to note, though, that the percentage of Jews of the, the general Polish population is much, much higher uh, than um, uh, are much higher than uh, in in other countries. Um, this is interesting. There's a fellow named Samuel Casso. He's a professor of this, and he he uh, is also famous for uh, his work on the Ringblum Oinig Shabbos uh, archives. Does anyone know who this is? So basically, as the Jew, as the Germans uh, control the Warsaw Ghetto, this fellow named Emanuel Ringblum realizes what's going on. He realizes there's a genocide, and he puts together a group called the Oinig Shabbos group, and they commit themselves to writing the history of what is happening during the Holocaust. They hide it, and eventually. Uh, it is found. Uh, so that's uh, th that's sort of a very, very tiny uh, nutshell of what happened during the Holocaust. Basically, you do have the brutality of the Germans, of the Nazis. Uh, you have the fact that the Nazis build most of the concentration camps in Poland. Most Jews killed in the Holocaust are killed in Poland, not just in Auschwitz-Birkenau, but many other camps. Uh, but at the same time, you have individual Poles that save Jews. But by and large, uh, you don't see pictures like you see, let's say, more in Vilna of Jews fighting in the forest together with Polish national resistance. Uh, the Polish national resistance is opposed to uh, uh, protecting Jews, and it even jeopardizes their lives. When the Polish government that's in exile in London says to sort of give itself legitimacy that it, after the war it will return all the property that's stolen from Jews to the Jews, which is a pretty basic thing, uh, they uh, get back feedback from Poland. Are you crazy? We love to have these houses, these businesses. And so uh, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it, it ends up being that they, they, they were not kind to their Jews. Worse than that, in a sense, is what happens after the Holocaust. And you know this better than me. The Jews who come back once the Holocaust is over are pogromed. 
Uh, there are many, many pogroms uh, the, the, against the Jews, whether small scale, the, not many huge scale, just because there are you know few Jews. But basically, when Jews come back, there's the famous pogrom in Kielce. Uh, when Jews come back, they're beaten. They're told, don't come back. Some because you know the Poles didn't want to give up the property that they stole from Jews, and others just because they were plain old anti-Semites. Uh, and and so I think to to me. That's uh, also a tragedy that Jews were not able to come back after having all those centuries in Poland. And uh, you look at the number of Jews today in Poland, it's between 7,000 and 10,000. So you can compare that with uh, hundreds of thousands living in uh, uh, Germany, France, Britain. Uh, clearly, there is uh, uh, anti-Semitism there and also uh, Jews who go there on, on tours if they're wearing a yarmulke, which is true, by the way, in, in many other European countries, they get beaten up, etc. Uh, so the history of Jews in Poland is complicated. There's definitely a portion of Polish society that is not anti-Semitic and very regretful of what happened. Uh, but it's, uh, I would say, the, the way the government of Poland deals with things today is very cynical and abusive because uh, on the one hand, you can't, you know, you can't call them out for everything because they are in control of uh, uh, the Auschwitz uh, camp and other camps, which are, you know, monuments of history. Uh, they are the guardians of those places. They're also the, gar the, the guardians of the biggest Jewish cemetery in the world, Poland, right? There are millions of Jews killed there. So there's a lot of Jewish history there. Uh, and uh, that's on the, the, you know, their side is that they're also victims of German aggression. But at the same time, they also are very cynical and they turn to Germany and they say, we want reparations for you killing the Jews who lived here, even though we passed a law banning Jews from getting any reparations, even getting their own property back. So that's a painful topic that ends up in the news every few months. Uh, but uh, there are Jews living there and they have these very successful Jewish life festivals every now and then in Krakow and other cities. What country in Europe has the most Jews? I, you know, I'm not sure if it's France or Britain. Uh, I believe that is, uh, I believe it is, it, 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 I'm not sure. I think it's France, but uh, I, I don't want to say, but it's either uh, France or Britain. It's ironic, though, that, uh, you know, with all this history in mind, one of the friendliest countries to Jews in Europe is uh, Germany, Germany and, and Russia was for some time, uh, you know, both of which were, were terrible to us. So, uh, yeah. Of course, um, there's a lot of anti-Semitism in France, but at the same time, you don't, you know, there's still many, many thousands of Jews living there. So you don't see that in Poland, meaning it's possible to have a Jewish day school. It's possible to have a yeshiva, a kosher food, kosher restaurant. You have that in France. Uh, you hardly have that in Poland. Uh, so it's, it's a tough, it's a tough subject. You didn't mention what the church is. Uh, well, the church in many cases hid Jews in monasteries. Well, there, the, look, I, I didn't cover every topic, but I will tell you famously that one Polish uh, person in the context of, of, of the church, which must be mentioned in a good context, is a, a, a young priest in a small town. Uh, and uh, they came to him after the Holocaust. They said, there's a Jewish kid that was in the monastery. Should we raise him as a Christian or give him back to his family? Which in many cases, people did not give him back to his family. And he said, uh, give him back to his family. And he later became the Pope uh, who visited here in the synagogue. Uh, so he was, uh, I would say, uh, in many ways, a righteous man in, in that he told people to give back the children to, uh, to you know, to back to, uh, back to the, the families that they came from. I see uh, a last question here. In Lublin, yeah, there are there are there are Jews there. Uh, just one question here from the audience asked me, "What are my relations with not with non-Jews as a child?" And uh, the answer is, I grew up in Israel, so. Uh, we were basically surrounded by Jews. Yeah. All right, next week, Bezrat Hashem, we will be speaking about uh, the Jews in Italy. Uh, and that's a community that goes long back. Obviously, uh, we have our, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, 
destruction of the temple and the Roman occupation of Israel, but there were also Jews living inside Italy. We're going to speak about uh, this community, which is one of the oldest Jewish communities in the world. And I just wanted to thank everyone for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And Bezrat Hashem next week, same time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, 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 sorry. Um, just one, there are just one question that came here for you. Sorry, that question was meant for you. Uh, what was your relationship to, if you want, you can come speak from here. What was your relationship uh, with the, the uh, non-Jews in, in Przemysl and Poland? Well, we had a lot of friends. A lot of friends? Well, not yeah. Well, a family. Polish family hid you, right? So yeah. you obviously had a, a, a good relationship with some. Wow. Okay. So that's uh, that's the answer. A Polish family saved their family. Uh, yes. All right. So that, that look, Jews in Poland, it was always a sort of a complicated relationship. They were in many ways closer with Polish non-Jews than uh, Jews in other communities were the, with Gentiles. But then also a lot of times the, the anti-Semitism. Side you live side. together side by side. That's right. Yes. No, no difference. Same thing. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, Professor Ayafa Elia was hidden, and her mother was killed after the war mm -hmm. in a pogrom. Wow. Really? Yafa Elia's mom? She lived was, in this country. So I'm just going to repeat that. So Yafa Elia's mom, who she's from Aishishok, which is close right. to Radin, where my family's from. So they were killed when they came after. Well, uh, her mom was her mom after was the Holocaust. Her. Wow. Her mother, uh, when the program, her mother, she was under her mother, and uh, the gun hit her mother. Hit her mother. Wow. And her mother was killed, mm -hmm. and she was orphaned, and she wow. went to um, uh, Barbadia, uh, mm -hmm. in Israel. Yeah. And she was brought up as a Jew. As a Jew. Wow. And Abraham Foxman was also. Same story. There's a famous song about Abe Foxman. Yeah, the, the man from Vilna. Yes, that was Abe Foxman from the ADL. Uh, after the war, mm -hmm. uh, he was brought up as a Catholic. Right. Yeah. And his parents survived the war. Yeah. And came to him. And somehow. Yes, that's the famous him. man from Vilna. Yeah. And he. You know, the rest is history. The rest is history. But they weren't going to give him back. No, they did not want to give him back, but yeah. uh, uh, the family asked a few times. Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.